Welcome to the Companies and Markets Show. It is Thursday, the 30th of June. I'm Dan Jones, Deputy Editor of Investors Chronicle. My regular co-host, John, is on holiday, so you're stuck with me this week. But I will shortly be joined by some of the IC's best and brightest to discuss topics, including our result of the week, which is WISE. Our tech guru, Arthur Sants, will be on hands to talk about that. Uh, then our company's editors, Mark Robinson and Julian Hoffman, We'll be chatting about small caps difficult 2022. And finally, our funds editor, Dave Baxter, will be discussing his feature on the increasingly unnoticed world of the share club. Uh, but before all that, a roundup from the week just gone. Uh, after months of delay, Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng has said he's minded to accept two uh, defence takeovers. They are, of course, the sale of Ultra Electronics to private equity owned Cobham and Parker Hannafin's bid for component supplier Megit. Uh, in other takeover news, Barclays has spent $2.3 billion to buy specialist lender Kensington Mortgages, thereby increasing its footprint among the buy-to-let and self-employed borrower segment. Uh, in utilities, Ofgems unveiled a five-year plan to prepare local energy grids for the clean energy transition, saying consumers should see no bill increases as a result, but again stating that investors, on the other hand, would see lower returns. In the markets, it was a pretty good week till today, at least. Uh, benchmarks in the US and the UK have been making solid gains for the first time in a while. But today's 2% fall for the FTSE 100 and 250 has taken the shine off that somewhat. Economics wise, retail sales contracted 0.5% in May, according to the latest data. That figure was slightly better than expected, though. And retailers, including Moonpig and BNM, have made relatively positive noises in trading updates this week. On the downside, UK consumer confidence has fallen to its lowest level in almost 50 years. And Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey has said inflation will persist for longer in the UK than most other nations. Against that backdrop, strike action continues. Barristers, teachers, firefighters, the Royal Mail and potentially BT for the first time in 35 years are among those either striking or seemingly on the verge of doing so. And with companies continuing to limit costs as best they can, supplies are being squeezed. Some of the bigger ones, though, are fighting back. Kraft Heinz this week paused the supply of major products to Tesco after a row over rising prices, leaving the supermarket lacking ketchup and baked beans, among other products. So let's turn to our result of the week, which is wise. Arthur Sands, as mentioned, is here to discuss uh, the company's latest figures, Arthur, you covered them uh, in our pages this week. What's the general uh, sort of view on how that performance looked, what we can expect in the future, and so on? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, the sort of, I guess, the headline figures. So, actually, I'll probably start with what WISE does for anyone who's not familiar. They're a payment company who enable people to transfer money internationally. And their sort of U, um, USP is that it's really cheap to do it on WISE. It's around, I think last year was 0.63% fee to, on average, to do an international transfer. Sort of historically, before WISE, when people had to do it through banks, the fees are as high as sort of like 3%. So they would credit this business to help people transfer money internationally with low fees. And they've been pretty successful at it. They IPO'd last year, but they've been growing a lot. And I guess the headline sort of figure from these results is they're continuing to grow a lot. Revenue growth was up 33% and it had 31% more customers. So more customers transferring more money, more revenue for WISE, which is all, all good stuff for them. The issue though, I guess, is that, and what has concerned the markets with them, their share price dropped quite a lot on the back of the results, is that their operating costs have increased a lot. I guess the hope with WISE was that sort of as they increase the number of customers, they would get economies of scale and the, their margins would improve as their sort of customer growth went up. But actually, this hasn't really proven to be the case in the short term. They've been investing, uh, their sort of operating costs were up like 50%, mostly driven by paying more to their employees, especially in the tech sector. It's been pretty competitive to bring in employees. So tech companies have been having to increase salaries. But they've also started spending more on marketing. Historically, their sort of strategy was using, to quote them, like word of mouth to um, increase the number of users they had. But now they've sort of started spending more money on marketing. Marketing expenses are up like 30 or 40%. I think part of the reason for this might be that 
there is going to be more competition in the market. Um, coincidentally, on the same day that Wise's results came out, this startup Atlantic Money got an EU um, license. And Atlantic Money said that they would, it's a three pound flat rate for any transfers, any international transfers up to a million pounds. So for like <laughs> three pounds on a million pounds is nothing. So like up to sort of the higher transfer amounts, it's going to be a lower fee than Wise. So maybe Wise's concern that sort of more competition comes into the market, drives down the fees, and then your margins are smaller. It kind of reminds me a bit of the sort of utility sector in the UK, where you can only really compete on offering the lowest the lowest price. And like with these transfer services, there's not like much brand loyalty. People just go where they can get the lowest fees. So if the fees are being driven down, maybe you have to invest more in sort of marketing and stuff to try and create other benefits around the transfers. They also like introduced this new service called Assets, where people in the UK can easily convert the cash in their accounts into stocks and then like invest in the stock market. So they're like trying to bring in these like other services to maybe make their product a little bit stickier. But I guess that's what's kind of got the markets a bit spooked is that maybe these sort of economies of scale and the sort of network effects that they hoped for might not be there. It's always what's the name of that company again? Sorry. Um you were talking about i think the next time i have to transfer a million i might make a note of it so, so. <laughs> um yeah you know, i wonder what you'd be transferring a million for julian um it's atlantic what? atlantic money they were started money. by some ex robin hood um robin hood guys and they've now started atlantic money you can read into that what you will but i mean the, the, sort of you have put your finger on the the problem for them isn't it because the, there is that other startup called revolute which is out, out for a banking license it's quite a commoditized market really isn't it, in some ways yeah exactly yeah exactly i've actually then moved it from so i covered their half year results is the first time i covered them and i had them on a hold and then actually in the most recent results i switched them to a speculative buy because their share price has fallen 60 percent in the last year so valuation has come down a lot and they have 33 percent revenue growth last year they're expecting 35 percent revenue growth next year and i think this has their they expect by 2024, the sort of fact set consensus is their EPS to more than triple, which in the moment gives them a 2024 P of 28, I think, which is seems if you just look at the revenue growth figures, they're also profitable in cash generative, like they had 100 million of free cash flow last year, which is like a 2% yield. So you've got 30% top line growth, 2% free cash flow yield, all looks pretty good. And for a um, two year P of 28 like that all looks affordable but i guess the, the issue is is that and they expect operating margins despite what i mentioned earlier with rising costs to stay in the low 20s during this time which is still pretty decent margin so like all of those figures suggest that they seem like not a bad time to get in but obviously we have this issue as you mentioned julian with the sort of commoditization and how are they going to compete and will that well, they have to bring down their margins to compete with the other businesses that come in. The underlying one is, as we, we've touched on, is that, you know, that giant target addressable market, but how much of it can you actually get given low barriers to entry, competition, you know, things like that, without massively increasing your costs? Um, after you made the point that um, the company, you know, Wise has been quite insistent, it's operating a disciplined approach to return on investment for marketing, as, you know, one would hope. But that's in some ways the, the key question really is to whether they can get the bang for their bucket on that side of the business, I suppose, from now on. Uh, we've but, had plenty of other examples in the tech space, though, when uh, disruptors have been disrupted themselves. And um, it's, it's interesting wise or transfer wise as it used to be. It actually came into um, the London listing, an unusual London listing at that, uh, with revenues and cash flows. And that isn't always the case. But I guess I guess the problem now, you know, traditionally they'd they'd have been up against uh, concerns like Western Union and uh, Wells Fargo. Um, they've come in, disrupted that space. But very often in these situations, you don't necessarily get first mover advantage. It can actually be a disadvantage at times because you you're the one that ends up uh, you're the one that ends up making the the, the mistakes in the business. Uh, setting the template for the new charging uh, structure. I, I guess the, the one positive 
we say that there's obviously going to be um, competitors and increasing competitors in the market, but we'll have to see on that score because uh, obviously with interest rates uh, moving up as they are in the fintech space, that's the numbers have prol proliferated mainly because interest rates have been negligible for the last mm -hmm. decade or so. I mean, they still are rel relative to history, but if that keeps on going up, the cost of capital is going to, to rise, obviously. And um, it'll be a dis disincentive uh, um, for many other companies that want to disrupt in this space. Yeah, I guess there's actually probably an advantage for WISE is if it becomes more difficult for these sort of startups to raise money in the high interest rate environment we're in now, it'll be harder for them to disrupt WISE. And then WISE also has no debt on its balance sheet. It's got like 300 million of net cash. And on top of that, I think that it's probably quite a nice way because like as inflation, it should pass through inflation to its revenue pretty easily because it takes a percentage cut of each transfer. So if like if there's inflation's happening, people are getting wages go up, people get paid more money, they'll just transfer more money to each other. Most people use it for like transferring money back to their families. So if they go and work in another country, they'll be making money in that country and then transfer money back to their families. I also talked to someone the other day who paid the contractor that she was using in Georgia, who was doing some market research in Georgia for her, and she used TransferWise to like pay her. And if there's inflation in society, these transfer fees are just going to go up, which means that WISE will take a bigger percentage. Well, sorry, not the same percentage, but a bigger gross value. So like, that should help sort of increase revenues, which is like a nice business model in a world where currently lots of companies are really worried about inflation. I know that they, they've also sort of become a kind of shadow banking universe in a funny sort of way because there's you know there's that there's that issue where people suddenly get cut off from their bank accounts because of allegations of money laundering and the wise and revolute to this world seem to be the standby um sort of way of being able to transfer and spend money if your your traditional bank suddenly rings up and says i'm sorry but <laughs> we suspect you of, of of money laundering and also that um there's quite a few um ukrainian refugees in the area where i live and, and every single one of them has got a wise account and that's the way that they've managed to keep going um living over here so it's uh, you know it's got a definite utility whether that translates in the long term into something that's more um market dominant um remains to be seen i mean there, there seems to be an impression that they're they're all eating each other's lunch at the moment in terms of you know, the, the next one comes along and it's a bit cheaper um, on a wider basis as well, I think that uh, uh, regulators and uh, and indeed the, the government will be looking closely at WISE's progress because it was um, came to market um, on a, a, a dual class share structure. I mean, they, they've done it that way. They didn't raise any additional capital. It was just the, the owners selling off what they had or at least partially what they had. And it, th this was a way that the government was hoping to attract more fintech uh, companies into that space. I think the other one that came, comes to mind was, was the Hup Group as well. I think that had a similar dual class share structure and it's um, it's received some criticism uh, you know, subsequent to the, uh, the IPO. Well, actually, technically, I don't think it is an IPO, but um, yeah, it's, it's something that regulators will be looking at because obviously uh, the treasury would be very keen to get uh, a lot more publicly listed uh, fintech stocks. Yeah, I guess we should also probably mention the fact that the CEO is being investigated currently by the FCA for like deliberately defaulting on taxes. Well, it's it was something of a mini miracle the uh, results uh, were ever published anyway, because their uh, their CFO Matthew Bry has had a a terrible cycling accident, and he's only been back in back in business for about a month now, but he still managed to to oversee the results, which is uh, good stuff. I mean, it, it's a really interesting company. And I, I, I tend to concur with Arthur's view on it, that it, it could well be a speculative buy, given the fact that they've already got revenues, cash flows. Uh, it's going to become an, an, in, uh, an increasingly crowded space. But my, my view is that with the interest rates going up, some potential uh, competitors, uh, you know, that, that might think twice about going public. And the or other more. thing I suppose is, you guess from the point of view of, you know, fintechs maybe struggling a bit more, you know, obviously labor markets are tight, but in tech we are starting to see, you know, some layoffs, certainly in the US, and that might, you know, mean that those 
costs is not necessarily that wise is going to lay off a load of people but it might be that that market becomes a bit more flexible and uh you know that might help on their cost side in terms of attracting new staff as well yeah yeah tesla sort of uh, made a few staff redundant uh, earlier on this week um so yeah, yeah yeah that's certainly going to be a a topic as we go forward as well yeah we will see um okay well Let's move on to our cover story of the week, uh, which is a slightly different one this week. It's written by a, uh, a guest writer for us, uh, Mark Lauber, a former banker, now professional investor, focused on listed and unlisted UK small caps. And with that in mind, um, his piece is really on the management teams of uh, smaller companies and how to spot the best, you know, the kind of tips and hints you can look for when trying to identify you know, which management can really uh, act as a catalyst for smaller companies. And, and you know, in, in this kind of market, that's really crucial given it's been a pretty painful year for small caps. We are on the final day of the first half of the year uh, today. And I think it's a half that most investors in the sector will be looking forward to moving on from. Mark isn't here, but Julian, I know you've sort of written on this recently as well for us about management and, you know, spotting good management teams, following management sometimes from company to company, you know, pursuing their um, their interests and making them your own interests almost. How do you see that uh, that process of, you know, identifying the best teams, the best people? Well, it's an interesting one, really, because there's a, there is a sense that some management is kind of, it's always about which management is prepared to do the most in terms of corporate actions. Um, and it's usually easier to spot a good turnaround management than it is to to follow a, a kind of foundational one if that makes any sense so <clears throat> there is a, a case that owner found owner managers are, are, are generally perform better in the long run because they have a an emotional and financial stake in the business which is very very long term so they're less likely to um take rash decisions or uh you know put the you know short-term interests of their pay packages over the long-term development of the company so I, I think that's probably a good sign I mean if you can if you can find decent owner managers if it's a turnaround situation someone with a long a long history of doing the um, uh, corporate actions which are sort of beneficial uh, that's always a good sign to look for unfortunately there isn't a science to this I think there is it is much more of an art than than anything else in terms of trying to spot it and uh, I, I think what you tend to find is that you know, 70 to 80 percent will fail in the long run, um, and it's the final 20 percent who share those those kind of solid managerial qualifications that seem to get through in the end. But uh, yeah, it's 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 not. I wouldn't envy anyone trying to spot. I mean, this is why Simon Thompson is so good at this, in that he can he can sort of sort out what the the wheat and the chaff is in the small caps world, and and he seems to be able to pick those 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 spaces very that space very very well um but yeah i wouldn't envy anyone who's like a venture capitalist who wanted to put <laughs> to put yeah. their cash into into god knows what and then hope to see something in 20 years time I, um I, I think those people are very very brave indeed on but, the uh yeah the simon thompson front we should not um uh avoid the opportunity to note that yeah his bargain shares portfolio for the year in a year when aim is down by 25 percent. i think last time i checked it's still still up for the year which is very creditable given it is largely game dominated um well he is a genius yeah. let's face it yeah. well yeah <laughs> might hear me disagree uh mark what, what what are your thoughts on um well i, I to that that last point uh, of julian's as well um it's just something that i've always uh, sort of been rather concerned about is management uh, pay structures as well uh because on the on the face of it you can understand the the logic behind um uh, providing incentives uh to uh, directors based on performance but very often uh they seem anomalous uh, 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 especially if they're if, if they're uh, caught up with uh, the level of earnings as well uh because very often we see in cases like this directors will make well actually a cynic would say directors sometimes make decisions based on their uh, own financial uh, interest rather than those of the uh, the companies uh, by you might you could even look at the, the the raft of buybacks that we've seen 
across the Atlantic and the UK in recent years. And there's, there's obviously there's not re reasons for that with, with the interest rate situation. But obviously, if you can boost, if you can boost earnings and somehow your pay structure is linked to that, uh, that can end up with that can end up with uh, negative outcomes. Uh, so that's that's uh, again, I'm, that, that, that's that's looking from a, a slightly different perspective. That look, looking for warning signs rather than the positives linked to, to management. I, I guess the you know the, the point that Julian made as well about uh, having skin in the game is is highly relevant as well. And very often um, in, in investors will look to family run concerns as well uh, because the advantages uh, that were that Julian laid out before us. But uh, I, I, I would reiterate his point that it's much more of a, an art than a science. Yeah, well, as, as I say, there are plenty of uh, tips and hints and, and things to consider in the uh, cover feature this week. So do look out for that. Um, uh, it is, yeah, it is quite an intriguing article and, and Mark, the other Mark, does bring a lot of his uh, experience to bear on that. Uh, so yeah, look out for that this week. Okay, we move on to the final segment today, which is, uh, again, something which isn't covered too much in the, the grand scheme of things. Share clubs. In some ways, some would think of these in the you know modern digital age as a slightly old-fashioned mm -hmm. uh, concept. The idea being, of course, you know, a group of uh, individuals and investors or so would-be investors get together and discuss, debate, and indeed invest in shares, in funds collectively you know pooling the knowledge in that way uh dave baxter our funds editor is with us uh dave's written uh, a feature on this that will be in next week's ic uh so look out for that next week but yeah dave it seems it's a rather under undercovered area uh nowadays you know it seems everyone is quite happy to to go online and and um you know work through the platforms themselves and that kind of thing and this is maybe a bit more old school you know getting together down the uh the local club and discussing your uh, your share picks but but what kind of things did you um discover and what kind of things were you interested in with this feature yeah i, I think there's been a lot of kind of interesting uh findings so that, as you say this is a, a kind of perhaps what was once in you know perhaps at the turn of the century a great investor institution and had a lot of take up and was a uh, yeah there was there was a lot of kind of momentum behind it nowadays um i suppose to start with the bad news nowadays share clubs do appear saving a miracle to be on the decline um, for various reasons, some of which, to be honest, relate to the industry. Because if you're running a share club, you need to have an investment platform account as a group and, and a bank account. And, and generally, there's been less, um, I suppose, interest in, in facilitating that. So if you look at the platform side, I spoke to all the major platforms. And uh, the vast majority don't have anything to do with um, share clubs nowadays. Um, if you look at the two kind of leading lights, um, you have Interactive Investor and you have Hargreaves Lansdowne. Neither of them now are, are currently accepting share clubs um, and they have seen kind of a, a big decline. So Interactive Investor, which has, has the kind of lion's share of, of clubs noted that the numbers have dropped significantly in, in recent years. Um, Hargreave similarly, they, they said they had several hundred accounts now, but that's less than 0.05% of their, their client accounts. And, and that relates to things like regulation, complexity, and, and also perhaps less demand. You know, as you alluded to, it's, it's easier now to be an individual investor. There are lots of resources, and uh, maybe we'll discuss this later. Perhaps there are different, more interesting, more kind of um, in keeping with the times forms of, you know, interacting with investor communities and kind of sharing that knowledge yeah these uh, even the very existence of these sort of investment club accounts was quite interesting to me because mm. you know it is the administration sometimes that is the barrier to you know taking these discussions into something more concrete you know obviously these accounts the idea being they do allow you to pool money in that way which mm. can be quite dif difficult to do if you're um not au fait with excel and, and all that but you did speak to uh, several investment clubs as part as part of the piece. So, yeah. you know, what were the, you know, some of the reflections they had on how their clubs work, uh, you know, the benefits they get from them, maybe, you know, sometimes the difficulties, because, you know, when you have X many people discussing a, a stock or a fund, you're going to get a variety of different opinions, I'm sure. There are lots of great positive stories about investment clubs. And, um, you know, I mean, so just, you know, this isn't really a side note, but perhaps seems less relevant is there's a huge social aspect, you know, um, 
one excellent quip someone gave me is their their club was once described as a uh, a drinking club with a, with a shares problem basically but th there are looking beyond that there are some kind of interesting um i suppose common lessons and reflections that can feed through into your kind of experience as a, an individual investor um so one is simply about kind of diversity of um it, with the club's diversity of background but i suppose that can translate into diversity of research and knowledge so you know clubs would tell me things like they they have groups including teachers stockbrokers um people who've worked in the retail industry and that basically helped feed through into a diversity of kind of ideas that people would pitch and a diversity of perspectives so people can give some level of insight into into different sectors and, and different kinds of companies i suppose that another interesting kind of finding so i imagine plenty of individual investors have found as well is simply a, a lot of the clubs have almost gone into more formal processes and you could almost say more kind of professional approaches where they're investing over time so some clubs it, it began as a bit of fun and they're essentially buying penny stocks or they're kind of chasing themes but they weren't really looking at fundamentals they weren't really kind of doing in-depth research and yeah they weren't thinking about the actual kind of strength of the the, the company itself so they were in some cases losing a lot of money and then deciding to you know either it remains kind of a source of fun or they uh, kind of revamped their processes and people started to have to do a lot more research and put in the work and start to you know understand you know some of the some of the concepts that uh, seem quite alienating first like your free cash flow yield or all the sort of things that you would look um as a kind of bellwether of, of how how well positioned a, a company is and then um i suppose finally just on, on a similar note some of the other things like kind of being disciplined and being diversified so that you the clubs some of the clubs now have been around for a very long time i spoke to one club that entered its 50th year this year um i spoke to various clubs in you know 15 year and 20 year mark so they've been through some you know rough market conditions and they've just found that it's kind of useful to hold your nerve and also useful sometimes not not to sell there are people who who said they use things like stop losses or certain target prices and over time they've learned either to kind of stick to their guns or to you know just take a closer look before they kind of panic and, and sell out the stock in the first place um yeah and and also diversification as well is just a, another thing that's helped them kind of ride those those difficult periods yeah i do i do find the whole topic really interesting uh you know i mean i suppose in some ways this podcast is our uh investment club <laughs> uh just a forum to discuss uh the the um topics of the day but mm. um uh it would be it would be great to see i suppose more of these things you know um a bit of a rebound you know the the vinyl of the investment world perhaps <laughs> some, something like that i'm not sure i don't know because, there's, yeah. there's four in my local town i mean i think that's four. it must must be to depend on demographics i mean there's, there's also the number of people over 80 is three times the national average um but uh, yeah did, did you find that at all david was there a sort of theme about who joined them or Dem you know? yeah there are demographic issues so one i didn't touch on this too much but one problem looking beyond the kind of um platform and banking side one issue is simply that a lot of the members are, are relatively or some of the members are relatively elderly now so they're kind of having to deal with that and many of the a, a problem with these clubs is it's quite difficult to kind of find one nowadays there's not really a central hub and it's also on the flip side that's quite hard to find new members and fresh blood um i did speak to one club interestingly where they're basically doing a kind of intergenerational approach where they're bringing in their kind of younger family members but um yeah you do find that demographic um side of things and anecdotally what was interesting as well from the, the various people i spoke to is it it was still in the cases i've looked at it has still been a kind of male dominated um forum um and and clubs have tried to bring more women in but it's been it's been uh kind of tricky to to shift those numbers um, you've just basically described camera there um, <laughs> as you said uh, another fear related fear. I, yeah. I always thought one of the advantages as well because i think it's uh as interesting you said about uh uh, Highgraves Lansdowne. Uh, it's quite depressing in a sense because I, I, I thought these 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 type of societies, if we can call them that, appealed to people 
who didn't have a great deal of investment uh, capital. And so mm. you know, when you when you pool it, uh, under ordinarily that means that you've got a, a relative reduction in your execution costs as well, which must be attractive rather than uh, go through that yourself and sort of returns, um, um, you know, re returns would improve as a result of that. And I, I, I was you know, under the impression as well as when you first come into investing, you know, it's an, it's an ideal way to, to share mm -hmm. ideas, get started. You know, pe perhaps this is something we should be pushing really. You know, you're sharing risk if you yeah. don't reduce capital as well. I mean, uh, there are plenty of benefits, I think. Yeah, um, we yeah. do have some um, details in the feature, as I say, which is out in next week's issue on how to get in touch with a couple of uh, uh, organizations. ShareSock is one who are interested in, uh, you know, encouraging membership of these uh, these clubs, which I think is fair to say is a good idea. Uh, so, yeah, so do look out for that in next week's IC. But for today, that brings us to the end of the podcast. Thank you to everyone for taking part. Uh, to Arthur, to Mark, to Julian and to Dave. And thank you to you for listening. We'll be back next week with another Companies and Markets show. Goodbye.